Good morning and welcome everybody to church this morning. It's great to see all of your beautiful smiling faces. My name is Jacob. I'll be leading us through the service this morning uh, and Pastor Reuben will be leading us in a sermon later on. Um, if you need the toilet, you can find those by heading back out the way you came and then swing around the whole way to the left and you will find those marked there. Uh, there's no Sunday school today as it is school holidays. Uh, there are some kids activity sheets on the table up the back if you wanted to use those. Uh, there will be a crash running uh, that will be starting after the kids talk. So, uh, But feel free to use the room if you need before then as well. To get us started and ready to worship, I'm going to read part of my old favourite psalm. I loved this psalm as a kid, even memorised it, and I still love it now. Psalm 100, the second half, says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Why? For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. I wonder if you can think of some ways the Lord has been good to you or some reasons why you could say that God is good. I've heard it said that we never appreciate breathing normally until we have a cold and your nose is blocked or running or the awful combination of the two. The same can be with the goodness of God. We don't appreciate it until something is wrong. So maybe this morning, nothing has gone particularly wrong. So let's appreciate that. Or maybe a few things have. Let's appreciate that we're all here now with our brothers and sisters and in the presence of our good God. Let's pray before we start. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, you are good to us. You bless us with life, with each other and with yourself. Lord, we praise you for all the good things you have done for us. We pray that you would prepare us well for this service, that you would give us ears to hear and minds to understand what you're teaching us. And Lord, we pray that you would encourage us through the fellowship with each other as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing to our amazing God with indescribable and Lord, I need you. To the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every teacher unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. lightning bolt where it should go, or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow, who imagined the sun and give source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night, none can fathom. Indescribable, 
uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God Oh powerful, untamable All struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Oh, powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God.
Lord, I need you. I love that song. But why do we need God? Why can't we do it ourselves? Why can't we save ourselves from getting impatient or hurting others or from holding grudges or from not falling into temptation? But it's more than that, isn't it? Why can't we love everyone on our own strength? The bar is high. The bar is perfection, in fact. Ephesians 2 tells us, You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We were dead in our transgressions, stuck in the mud of our sin. All the rules have been broken. There really is no hope for someone who is both dead and alone. They can't resuscitate themselves. But notice the language. Everything's in the past tense. The passage reads very different if it were in the present tense. I was going to change the tense and read it for effect, but there is a reason it's in the past tense, so that would not be helpful. Something has happened, something has changed. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. All that stuff I said earlier, all the bad things that we do, all the sin we were stuck in, it's all been paid for by Jesus. We don't have to worry about the past anymore. When we confess and put our faith in Jesus, we are considered right with God, clean. We don't need to worry about what we've done. We only need to start or continue to live for Jesus. Now, if you're new here today and have no idea what's going on, I get it. There's a lot of words being thrown around here. The Bible is a lot of words. Here's the take home of the gospel. We were stuck hurting others and God, separating us from Him. But God has provided an option to be free from doing that and free from the guilt and shame. Not because He had to, but because He loves you. There's so much more to unpack here. So please, if you're interested, have a chat with someone about it after the service. You can lead the conversation with, I'm interested in this gospel thing. Can you explain it more? And I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you. The passage ends with this. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, we aren't perfect yet. I'm so far from perfect. But we now have the ability to do good works, to say no to temptation, and, by God's strength, to work on being more like Jesus. And we have the hope that one day we will see God and be welcomed into His house, and on that day, we will be made perfect. How good is that? In a little while, we'll pray about all these things. But for now, it's time for the kids' talk. Coming up, kids, Hannah has a special message for you. Hi everyone. I have got a story for you today. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. Welcome everyone. Make yourself comfortable. All right. Our story today is called 
how to share your zucchini. The last quite a few Sundays, we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter in church. And today we're looking at some more of 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we see that sometimes we do good things, but then bad things happen. Especially when the good thing is telling someone else about Jesus. But rather than being afraid and saying nothing, Peter encourages us to speak out for Jesus. But when we do, we are to be truthful and gentle. All right, let's get into our story. Once there was a big blue furry monster called Mop. Mop lived at number 27 Badminton Road. One day, a zucchini farmer came past Mop's house. He had a very special gift for Mop. It was a zucchini. Mop had never been given a whole zucchini before. The farmer told Mop all about zucchinis and how great they were. Mop was convinced zucchinis were awesome. Just saying the word zucchini made his mouth drool. The man said to Mop, Mop, I want you to stay here and tell everyone the good news about zucchinis. Mop nodded. That would be easy because he loves zucchinis. Then the man said, one day I'll come back and give you my whole zucchini farm and anyone who loves zucchini can live there as well. With that, the zucchini farmer left. Mop could hardly believe his ears. A whole farm full of delicious, succulent, mouth-watering zucchini? He couldn't wait to tell someone the good news. He didn't have to wait long. Just then, Rhonda happened to pass by. Hello, Mop. How was all she could say before Mop interrupted her? Rhonda, you've got to try some of my zucchini. You'll love it. It's delicious. Mop so badly wanted Rhonda to like zucchini that he tried to force it into her mouth. Rhonda ran away. Mop was puzzled. Why didn't Rhonda love zucchinis? Um, maybe she didn't like the way it looked. Suddenly, he had a cunning plan. I know what I'll do, he said. I'll paint it orange and tell her it's a carrot. Maybe then she'll like zucchinis. And that's what he did. Mop painted the zucchini orange. The next day, Rhonda came walking down the road. Hi, Rhonda. Would you like to try some of my, uh, I mean, carrots, said Mop. Rhonda liked carrots, so she took a great big bite. That's not a carrot. That's your zucchini, she shouted. And again, she ran away. Mop was puzzled. Why had Rhonda run away when zucchinis were so good? Children, we have something much better than zucchini. We have Jesus. We have something even better than a whole zucchini farm to look forward to. If we love Jesus, then one day we will be in heaven with him forever. That's the best news ever. Good news that we need to share with others. But it is important how we tell people. Children, don't be like Mop. He tried to force Rhonda to eat his zucchini. We need to be gentle. 
people don't like being forced to believe the good news. Mop lied about his zucchini. He pretended his zucchini was a carrot. We need to tell the good news about Jesus truthfully. Children, don't be afraid. Tell people the good news about Jesus. But be gentle and truthful when you tell them. The end. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you and it's the best news ever that we get to spend the rest of eternity in heaven with you. We want to tell other people about this and we ask that you would help us, help us when we do, to be truthful about the good news and to be gentle in how we tell people. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to hop up and we're going to sing a song about Jesus, which is one way that we can share the good news of him with others. Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? J E S U S. Yes. He's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sea? Who's the king of the universe? The king of me, I'll tell you, J E S U S. Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, jungle and the sea. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Bubble, 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 bubble. The depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. In kind your ear to me anew. And him I cry for mercy, Lord. To count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will. Oh, 
been God alone. Take courage in His power to save. Completely and forever one. By Christ emerging from the grave. I will wait for you. some announcements now. Uh, so the offering this week is for World Transform, which, as the name suggests, seeks to reach the world and transform it with relief and support in the name of Jesus. Uh, they work in places where there may be emergencies or ongoing problems, uh, and they s provide uh, support, as in like relief um, items and money uh, where they're needed. If you wanted to give to this, there is a cash box at the back of the auditorium, uh, and above that there are bank details for those without cash. And please remember, all money given goes directly to World Transform, unless otherwise marked. Andrew Collins has an announcement for us, and after that, Zach as well. But while he's on his way up, I'm very happy to announce that Tiana and Sean Vidal have welcomed their daughter into the world this past week. Uh, both little Alyssa and Tiana are doing well. Please keep the whole family in your prayers, Andrew. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, if you checked your pigeonholes on your way in this morning, you would have found something a little bit different in there. Um, we are currently updating all of our congregation details. So for all of our members and all of our regular attenders, uh, this is an opportunity that we try to do once a year uh, and just to make sure that all of our details are up to date. Now, we use this for our directory, but we also use this for a lot of other demographic information for our church. So it's really important that you get that back to us. So if you check your pigeonhole, you'll find that there's a form. It should have all of your details for your family. If there is anything wrong, just scratch it out and write a new one, and you'll be able to pop that in a, a wooden box on my desk, and you can put it in there. If everything's fine and you don't need to update anything, either just toss it out of the bin or put it in the box as well, that will be fine. Now, if you don't have a pigeonhole or you have no idea what I'm talking about, just check at the back of the auditorium. You may find that you have one and I haven't told you you've got one yet, and that's my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, they're in alphabetical order, so they should be easy to find. If you still don't have one and you think you should have received a form, come and talk to me. I'll be hanging around by my office uh, after the service and we can talk about it then. Cheers.
Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that for a second. So uh, like it said in the promo video, uh, we're going to have an arts night. And it's, uh, there's lots of ways that you could be part of this. Um, and I'll just mention that a big part of this is just about having the opportunity to do something. This is not about being elite and super professional. This is about just having some fun together as a church community. Um, so also, it's a free event, uh, but we're looking to raise funds for IGM through donations, uh, which seeks to free people all over the world from slavery. So come along and be part of this and support this great cause at the same time. Friends and family are also very welcome, so feel free to invite people along. We've got three weeks left, so there's still plenty of time to put something together, and it'd be great to have lots of acts. Thank you. Uh, lastly, there is coffee and tea after the service today. Those members whose surnames start with W, A, B, and C are asked to help serve and clean up. Let's pray about all these things. I'll be basing this prayer on the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Lord, you deserve all the praise we can give and more. You, O oh Lord, are a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You bless us every day, Lord, and your mercy is new every morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray that we would seek your kingdom above our own desires. We pray that you would help us to live for you in everything we do. And we pray boldly that you would bring your kingdom to this world. Lord, we pray for more and more people to turn to you. And we pray that we would be tools in your shed for that change. We pray that you'd help us to be looking for people we can spread your love and your gospel to. Would you help us to see the doors you open for us and give us the words to say to spread the good news. And we ask for your mercy on this world. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, this is a vast church with so many different people living so many different lives. But Lord, you know each and every one of us personally. You know our struggles and you have compassion on your children. We pray that you would provide what we need. And we pray that you would be, we would be content with your amazing provision. Thank you that you care for us. Lord, we pray especially for the Vidal family. We thank you for the safe arrival of Alyssa, and we pray that you will be with the family as they adjust to being a family of five. We pray especially that you will be with Sean and Tiana as they seek to bring up their kids to know you and love you. Lord, thank you that we can give back a little to World Transform today. Thank you for the work they do in spreading your love through practical relief. We pray that you would enable them to reach even more people and spread your good news to them as well. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, we know we've sinned against you. We do it so often. We're selfish and we give in to temptation. Lord, we are sorry. We ask you to forgive us through Jesus. Lord, he's paid the penalty for us. Thank you for what he has done for us. And we thank you that we can not only be forgiven through him, but also released from guilt. You are so good to us. We pray that you would help us to pass on this forgiveness to those who have hurt us. Lord, we pray now for the reading and preaching of your word. We pray that you would help us to listen and understand. And please speak to us through Reuben. We pray all of this humbly and in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for the Bible reading now. I'd like to invite John Grafland to open that for us.
So I continue our reading in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, commencing at verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Thanks, John. Good morning, Riverbank. It's lovely to see you, especially if you're visiting. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name's Reuben, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm looking forward to opening up this passage with you now. Uh, if you've got a Bible open, that's great. Keep it there, and we will work through these verses together. Uh, the young apprentice was walking around the house uh, with his boss. Uh, it was the start of a new job. And his boss was explaining to him how the home reno was going to go, what they were planning to do, how it was going to look. And the apprentice was nodding and smiling and it all sounded great. Uh, and then the boss started telling him all the steps that needed to happen uh, in order to bring this reno about. And the apprentice continued nodding until they reached that little latched gate that led to the underneath of the house. And as the gate swung open, and the apprentice peered into the dark, cramped space, very low, filled with lots of concrete stumps, the smile faded from his face. And as, as his boss said the words, uh, 10 new stumps, whole 700 metres deep, they just kind of washed over the apprentice, and something in his brain suddenly kicked into gear. Wait a minute! What are you asking me to do? I, I've been under there, so I know what that's like. It's, it's a horrible job. And that's, that's kind of where we are in the book of 1 Peter today. Uh, today we come to that moment in the book where the smile falls off our face and we turn to Peter and we say, wait a minute, what exactly are you asking us to do? Now, if you've been with us over the last few weeks uh, in this book, you'll know that Peter has been preparing us to know how to live for God in a world uh, that may be quite godless uh, and even hostile towards Christianity. And we've all been nodding along as Peter said, well, I want you to live such good lives in the world. And then we became a little bit more uncomfortable when he said, well, I want you to also submit to the human authorities that God's put over you, like the government and, and your employer and, and your husband. But, but we were okay with it. Until today, when Peter really gets to the guts of it. And today, as the gate leading under the house swings open, we realize that there is a grueling, grotty, painful job ahead of us. Peter lays it out for us clear as day. He says, Christians should expect to suffer for our faith. I think that might actually be quite a timely warning. 
for us today. What do you think? It's not so hard to imagine that in Australia in 20 years' time, perhaps, we could be living out our faith in quite a hostile society. In fact, we're probably living in quite a similar situation now that Peter's first readers were in. Because for them, things didn't seem to have heated up yet to physical persecution. Uh, Emperor Nero hadn't come on the scene and started burning them alive. Uh, It seems that they're mostly facing verbal opposition. Verse 14 uh, speaks of, of threats. And verse 16 speaks of of malicious speech and slander. And here here is the question that Peter is asking them and that Peter is asking us. Are you ready? Are you ready to suffer for your faith? Do, Do you even know how to suffer as a Christian? Willingly, joyfully, patiently. I'm not sure that I do. Because let's be honest, suffering doesn't come naturally to us as Christians or even as humans, does it? In fact, I think we're hardwired to run away from suffering and, and to, to seek out comfort and pleasure however we can. And then add into the mix that that suffering could be unjust that it could intrude on our rights and accuse us unfairly, and I'm not sure any of us are really equipped to deal with that. I mean, think about it. How do you tend to respond when someone says something false about you? Something that insults or or degrades you. Something that humiliates you in front of others. Maybe this happens at work. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend you thought you could trust. Some of us, I think, we arc up, our blood boils, our inner lawyer comes out, and we defend ourselves. Maybe with words, maybe with punches, maybe by cold-shouldering that person out of our lives. Others of us, though, we, we withdraw, we hide away in fear. Or or we try to adapt to our environment, to blend in, to become what these people want us to be so that they'll like us or at least leave us alone. But, But Peter would say neither of those are good options. They're not good ways to deal with suffering. And Peter's going to show us another way, a better way. Let's look at that together now. I hope you'll join me as we look at how we can be equipped to suffer well as Christians. That's what we're talking about today. And we're going to see three things in this text about how we can suffer well. And the first is this, suffer for the right reasons. Suffer for the right reasons. In verse 13, Peter calls us to be eager to do good. And then in verse 14, he talks about suffering for righteousness' sake. Can can you think of a Christian who faces opposition, but it's for the wrong reasons? It's not for good reasons. Peter says, you don't get any brownie points if you bring it on yourself, because you broke the law, or you treated someone harshly, or you were a hypocritical Christian who talked the talk and didn't walk the walk. And so whenever we face opposition, it could be at work, could be on social media, could be from an unbelieving friend or family member, we need to ask the question, could this actually be because I've sinned? Is it because I've represented Christ well? Or is it actually because I haven't? Could this be because I've actually been speaking Christian truth in an ungracious, insensitive way? how to share your zucchini. And if the fault is ours, then we have an opportunity to model the gospel to that person in the way that we confess our failings. Yes, maybe even to them and seek their forgiveness. Okay, what then would be a good reason for a Christian to suffer? Have a look at verse 15. That's where Peter gets to the heart of it. Pardon the pun. He says, In your hearts... Revere Christ as Lord. This is a person whose attitudes 
and words and actions are shaped by the fact that in their hearts, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the water supply of their life. And so when they turn on the tap, Jesus-flavored water comes out. What might it look like for Jesus to be Lord of someone's life? What would that look like? Well, well, there's a gentle humility about this person. Because they know that they're, they're sinners saved by grace alone. There's a unique wisdom in how they act because their actions are shaped by Jesus. He shapes their morals. And there's a loving fearlessness about them when they're insulted. Uh, because they know that Jesus provides them with security and refuge that no one can take from them. That's why Peter says in verse 14, Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. There's an inner peace that no hardship in life can take away. Because they know God is always smiling on them. Peter says in verse 14, Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And there's a joyful hope in them. Because they know that God cares for them every single day, and one day after they die, they will be with Him in heaven forever. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Isn't that person beautiful? They're, they're humble, they're wise, they're fearless, they're, they're peaceful, they're joyful, they're hopeful. And these are beautiful fruits that only grow out of deep roots. They don't grow out of self-help books and positive thinking. They are the fruits of the Spirit. They are the fruits of someone who in their heart has enthroned Jesus as Lord and King. Uh, I read a sad story in the newspaper this week. Uh, Peter Vanderpoel showed me this article of a, of a chaplain uh, in the Australian Navy uh, called Colin Acton. And Acton began his work in the Navy as a Christian. But he said, quote, After seeing some nasty parts of the world, I started saying, Where is God in all of this? And I felt I couldn't sustain that. When serving in waters off the Middle East, Acton says, We came across boats which had people being smuggled, people who had become slaves, and I would think, Where is God in all this? I came to the end of my tether in Afghanistan, sitting with a young man who had lost his mate. It just sounded so threadbare to try to offer a religious solution. End quote. It was, it was Acton's job to, to share the hope of Christianity with the people around him, but actually the opposite ended up happening. Why? Because Jesus was never really the anchor of his soul. Friends, when suffering comes into your life, especially unjust suffering for being a Christian, it will quickly become obvious whether Jesus is the Lord of your life, whether he's actually the anchor of your soul, the hope of your heart, the hope of your life. Which is why Peter has been so desperate in this letter to deepen and strengthen our roots in Jesus. Do you remember back Chapter 1, verse 1, he said, you are God's elect, you're chosen by God. And then in verse 3, he said, you've been born again to a living hope of a glorious heavenly inheritance. And then Peter's been urging us again and again, make that your hope, make Jesus your hope, make him your Lord. The first command of the whole book in verse 13 was, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So, are you ready to suffer well? Well, that depends on whether Jesus is Lord of your heart and the hope of your life. You can't fake this. An item of clothing, it looks really nice on the rack at the shop, but it's not till you take it home and you wash it that you get to see its true shape and size. And let me tell you, in Australia, we are about to go through the wash. Our faith is about to go through the ringer. 
I think. And there's only one way we're going to come through that in good shape, and that is if in our hearts and in our church, we revere Christ as Lord. So how can we get ready to suffer well? It starts with Jesus. Jesus in your life, in your heart. It starts with you enjoying Him and trusting Him and obeying Him and taking refuge in Him. If Jesus is Lord of your life, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Others may despise you, but you're blessed by God. You're loved. You're chosen. You're secure. You're heaven bound. That's the first way we can suffer well. We suffer for the right reasons with Jesus as the dear and precious Lord of our lives. Now second, Peter tells us that in order to suffer well, we also need to seek the salvation of our accusers. We need to suffer for the right reasons, and we need to seek the salvation of our accusers. Verse 15 is such a well-known verse, isn't it? Read it with me. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do you see the progression there? Step one, come to Jesus. Step two, your life is transformed by hope. Hope that our God is a caring, saving God who is at work in this world doing great things and is one day coming back to make all things new. Hope. Come to Jesus. Have your life transformed by hope. Step three, it shows. Unbelievers see it. Because our hope is in the world to come, in another world, we live in this world with a totally different set of goals and values and desires, don't we? We have a completely different worldview on everything as Christians, or we should. And we have something, friends, that our world desperately longs for. Hope. I see this all the time in so many different ways. I see people deeply anxious about climate change. I see a loss of faith in politics and government. I see army chaplains walking away from their religion. I see parents shattered by the death of a child. I see young people doubting whether there could ever really be a version of themselves where they really feel safe and loved and purposeful. I see the elderly looking back on their lives and asking, was that it? I see people living in mansions with every single thing that's ever been invented, still unsatisfied, still craving more. And it is in those moments when the world runs out of hope and it runs out of answers that our Christian hope shines through. And Peter says, be ready. It'll happen, you don't know when, but be ready for people to ask you why you have a hope that they don't. And then we have to speak. Because they might be able to see hope, but unless we speak, they don't understand the reason for that hope. Don't ever think evangelism is just about good deeds. People need to hear the gospel in order to be saved. They need to hear about Jesus and the truth of Christianity. You know, if someone turned to you after church today, as Jacob has encouraged them to, and asked you what you believe, what would you say? Are you ready to give an answer? Not, not some heavy theological lecture, but, but a humble, simple explanation of a loving God and a sinful world and a Savior who died and rose again so that we could be saved. Many of us, I think, feel quite daunted by that. Which is why over the past few years at Riverbank, we've been trying to do some more training in this area. How to, how to speak about our faith. Uh, and if you'd like to grow in this area, 
uh, I would like to strongly recommend that you take a look at this book, Organic Outreach for Ordinary People uh, by Kevin Harney. You can, you can go to our church library down the hallway and, and borrow a free copy uh, and it will really help you, I think. So Peter says in verse 15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But then did you notice what he says next? There's a qualifier. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So as we give our answer, Peter wants us to keep two things in mind. First, what is my tone and manner? And second, what is my goal in saying this? We're gentle, Peter says, because we want to show them the love and grace of Jesus. We're gentle because we know we can't drag them to God kicking and screaming. And we don't have the power to change their hearts. So we're gentle. And we're respectful, Peter says, because they aren't the enemy. Even if they're insulting us, we love them as fellow humans made in God's image. And we have compassion on them as sinners who are actually lost and so far from God. And we remember that our goal is not to make a sinner feel guilty or win an argument, it is that they would be saved. So there we go. How do we suffer well as Christians? First, we suffer for the right reasons. Second, we actually seek their salvation. We seek the salvation of the lost, even those who are unfairly accusing us. And now third and finally, Peter says that in order to suffer well, we need to set our hope on the victory that Christ has already won. We need to set our hope on the victory that Christ has already won. And that brings us to verses 18 to 22. I don't know if you noticed these as we uh, had the Bible reading. They're some of the most confusing verses in the Bible. Famous theologian Martin Luther once said, This is a strange text and certainly a more obscure passage than any other passage in the New Testament, I still do not know for sure what the Apostle meant. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, there are things in this passage that we may, may never be completely sure about. Certainly, there's going to be lots of details that we're not going to have time to dig into this morning. But that doesn't mean we can't learn anything from these verses. In fact, I think if we step back from the details and look at the main argument that Peter's making... His point is actually pretty clear. Have a look with me. It begins in verse 18 with the words, For Christ also. For Christ also. In other words, Peter is about to hold up Christ to us as some kind of example and pattern. He wants to tell us something about Christ in the context of Christians will suffer but they don't have to fear. Christians will suffer, but they don't have to fear, and it has to do with Christ. And then he goes on, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. What's Peter talking about here? Well, notice the theme is innocent suffering. And we aren't the first ones to experience that. Christ did it too. And it wasn't pointless. It was actually to bring us to God, to save us. So Peter wants us to identify with Christ. It's what he's been calling us to do a number of times in this book. Jesus is our example. He's our pattern. He's the model that we follow. Okay, but what exactly is this example, this pattern? Peter says, verse 18, he was put to death in the body. What's that referring to? That's the crucifixion. But made alive in the Spirit. What's that? That's the resurrection. And then Peter says, verse 19, 
after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Now, some people think that this is referring to Jesus preaching through Noah to the wicked people of Noah's day. But I think there's another explanation that makes more sense if we look down at verse 22, where it says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. Okay, I'll put some slides up to help us see the movement of this text. Uh, This is a chart from Martin Williams at the RTC. Verse 18, Jesus is put to death in the body. That's His crucifixion. Then it says He's made alive in the Spirit. That's His resurrection. And then verse 19, after being made alive, he went. Where does he go? We're not quite sure, but the most logical next step would be his ascension. He goes to heaven. Does that fit with what follows next? Yes. Verse 19 to 20, he proclaims his victory to the imprisoned spirits. That is, the sinful fallen angels who have been locked in chains ever since they sinned in the time of Noah. And then verse 22, after this proclamation, Jesus is enthroned in heaven with all angels, authorities and powers in submission to Him. Okay, there's a theory. Does it fit with Peter's broader argument? Does it fit the context? Yes, it does. Here are innocent Christians, remember? They're suffering for their faith. And Peter has been calling them through this book to submit, just as a submissive son submitted to death on a cross. But here's the thing, Peter wants us to see that is not the end of the story. Because the example of Christ doesn't end with submission on a cross. The submissive suffering one is raised up and he's glorified and he's exalted as Lord of all. See how the tables are turned in verse 22. Now, everything is in submission to Him. Which would mean that when Jesus goes and makes proclamation to these imprisoned spirits, He isn't proclaiming the gospel to them so they can be saved. He's actually announcing their judgment. In His resurrection and ascension, Jesus conquers all evil. And His victory is is their defeat. We can turn those slides off now. Why would Peter want us to know this? Because he wants comfort. He wants to comfort discouraged, suffering Christians. He wants us to see Christ as a pattern, as an example. Yes, the innocent Saviour suffered, but it was part of God's good plan. And in the end, the very thing that looked like defeat and shame actually led to glory and victory. What does that mean for us? It means that whatever suffering and persecution comes against us in Australia, whatever spiritual forces attack the church, it is all under Christ's authority. It is all in submission to Him right now. And so, for all of us who trust in Christ and share in His sufferings, we can be absolutely certain that glory will follow. We will share in His glory. Isn't that the trajectory of the Christian life? Down and then up. Humiliation and then vindication. Suffering and then glory. And when we understand that, it also helps us, I think, to understand verses 20 to 21. Peter uses Noah to illustrate his point. Noah also faced terrible opposition, but God was faithful to him and saved him. Noah and his little family of eight, they probably felt so so alone, with the whole world against them and mocking them as they sat in the desert building an ark. But when the waters of judgment came, they were vindicated because they put their faith in God. 
and so it will be for us. I'm not sure if you've ever watched uh, any of the American TV show called The Office. It specializes in a type of comedy that just leaves you cringing in your seat. But there is one particular episode which I think is the most awkward. It's so awkward I can barely even watch it. We learned that 10 years ago, local businessman Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell, he went to a local primary school and he promised an entire third grade class that if they graduated from high school, he would pay for their whole university tuition. Well, it's now 10 years later, and Michael Scott is realizing he has made a promise he will never be able to keep. There is no way he can afford the uni fees of a whole class of kids. The problem is, those kids are nearly finished high school, and they're still expecting him to pay. In fact, his generous offer has motivated them all for the last 10 years, filling them with hope, inspiring them to study hard and dream big. And the episode depicts the moment when Michael has to go to the school, face all these kids who are clapping for him, think he's their hero, and he has to tell them they won't receive any money. It's absolutely devastating to watch as he pops their dreams. And it's not helped when, at the end, he tries to offer them a, a gift to ease the pain. He offers each of them a laptop battery. The kids are left with nothing but crushed dreams and a battery to a laptop that they don't even own. Are we like those poor kids? Have we placed our hope in something just to have it let us down one day? Is all the suffering and the sacrifice worth it? Does God even care? how hard it is to be a Christian sometimes? Does he know how much his people are suffering around the world? 380 million Christians today are said to face high levels of persecution. That's one in seven Christians. Is he ever going to come back and keep his promises? Peter says, look to Christ. And look at his footsteps. That's how you prepare to suffer well. That's how more and more we can become Christians who are fearless and gentle and peaceful and joyful. When we see that the victory has already been won and we set our hope on that. We're like a little boy hopping along the beach behind his dad placing his little feet into each big footprint in front of him. All we need to do is keep following Christ. We wake up each day and we put our feet in his footprints and we can be sure that they will lead us home to glory. Suffer fearlessly and graciously, dear Christian. Because Christ is Lord and his victory is yours. Let's pray. Lord God, we don't know what is coming, only you know the future. But we do know that you have told us, Jesus has told us, Paul has told us, Peter has told us, all the prophets of the Old Testament have shown us your people are exiles in this world and they will suffer and they will be outcasts and they will sometimes face opposition and hostility and maybe imprisonment and maybe even martyrdom. Lord, you tell us this morning not to fear. And we admit that that's hard. We are scared sometimes, and we are prone to respond badly, some of us melting away and wanting to hide somewhere, and others of us firing up with our blood boiling, standing on our rights, and yet sadly not 
really showing the love and grace of Christ as we do that. Please, Lord, lead us into a better way, where in our hearts Christ is Lord. And where we trust that if we follow Jesus, he will lead us safely through suffering into glory. Thank you, Jesus, that even now all angels and authorities and powers are in submission to you. That you are risen, victorious, reigning at the right hand of God and we have absolutely nothing to fear. And like Noah and his family, one day we will come through the flood and we will walk out into a sunny new world, vindicated, your people with you forever. We praise and thank you for Jesus and the gospel and the salvation we have in him. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, the music is going to come up. We're going to sing Lion of Judah. Now, let me read for you the first, first words that we're going to sing in this song. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. Let's stand and sing of the victory that we have in Christ. for us, Reuben. I certainly found it challenging uh, to think about how we can suffer graciously. Um, yeah, that'll be one I need to work on. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, uh, or if you would like prayer or a chat, myself and Pastor Reuben will be up the front at the end of the service. Please remember to pick up your kids from creche as well, so that the leaders can come and fellowship with the rest of the congregation. Uh, a reminder to those whose surnames are starting with W, A, B, and C, you have the opportunity to service coffee after the service. Uh, also remember our afternoon service at 5 p.m. Pastor Jack will be opening up the topic of prayer with us. Let me read from Romans to close. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing to close. Have a blessed week. of the heavens and earth, exalted by the roar of the multitude, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The cry of hallelujah resounds, the fullness of time shows his victory, justice and truth are revealed, his wisdom loves all. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah the Almighty Praise, let us all rejoice and give Him all our praise, our praise. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, Hallelujah to the God of power, people of the Lord are ready. Servants of God, all who fear Him come with a small or great, fall before His throne in awe and worship Him. Blessed are those who will feast at the glorious banquet of God Himself. The wedding of the Lamb has come; His bride is now here. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the God of Love, let us all rejoice and give Him.